Hello, everyone, and happy Mother's Day to all moms. For most moms, motherhood has changed dramatically over the last eight weeks. Being a mom has always been demanding, but many moms have now become full-time teachers and principals. Many are still working part-time or full-time. And of course, everyone in the house would like mom to be a short order cook too. The two things moms are doing less during the pandemic are resting and sleeping. Okay, they are visiting hair and nail salons less often also, but if you notice the consequences of that fact, my advice is keep it to yourself. And when you combine all the demands with the perfect mom propaganda on social media, it can be disheartening for a mom. When you see that other people's kids are cooperating with homeschool, that Harvard and Stanford are recruiting someone second grader for college, that someone else's home looks ultra organized, that another mom has gained life-changing spiritual insight during the pandemic while you're just trying to survive, while simultaneously perfecting the quads and biceps, throw it all in the mix and it's easy to conclude that since your world doesn't look as idyllic as theirs, you don't measure up. That's how moms are lured to worship the false goddess of perfectionism. And if you throw in a judgmental parent or a critical spouse, someone who suggests you're inadequate, it can be debilitating. So moms, don't take the bait. Don't buy into the myth that you don't measure up. One of the moms on our staff shared this axiom that says it so well. There are a million ways to be a good mom but there is no way to be a perfect mom. Today, we are going to let go of perfectionism. And not just moms, all of us. Because perfectionists experience more frustration and forfeit more joy, and oddly, in the history of the world, not one perfectionist has attained perfection. Ironically, the more we strive for perfection, the more likely we are to fail to realize that we are perfectly suited for the imperfect lives we are living. I was one of those kids who loved church camp. Why? Because I like to win. And at church camp, doing the right things made a winner out of you. If your team lined up straighter than other teams, you won. If your bunk was neater than those of other campers, you won. If you memorized more scriptures than other kids, you won. If you performed the most compelling Bible skit, you won. And if you did enough winning things and said enough winning things, your team could win for the week, and you might even be named Camper of the Week, the ultimate victory at a week of Christian camp. Now, that sounds like a successful week of Christian camp, but if you look at it through the lens of Scripture, it does raise some questions. Titus 3, 4 says, When the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. I'm all for camp and competition that encourages good behavior, but we have to remember the basis of God's love for us is not our spiritual performance. So while Christian camp was good for me, and I love seeing Westside kids and students attend camp, I learned year after year that receiving accolades at Christian camp did not guarantee me the inner strength to perform well spiritually when I got home. I could create the illusion of near perfection for a week of camp because after all, it involved competition, which I loved. But it didn't always translate for the rest of the summer on the job or for an entire semester at school. My imperfection would always break through and make me wonder if the guy at camp was a fraud. And that tempted me to pretend. So I tried to perform well spiritually for my church friends and tried to perform socially for my other friends. If you have ever tried the be good to win spiritual points approach to your faith, I'll bet you've experienced the same disappointment. And just so we're clear, this is a game adults play too, is it not? If you have one identity that you claim in your spiritual community, and another that you claim among those who don't follow Jesus, you know what I'm talking about. Trying to live that way makes you feel incomplete in either environment. What I'm saying is that perfectionism breeds pretense. And pretending leads us down a path of spiritual decline. 
Have you ever participated in an activity and realized that nearly everyone there was better than you? That's how it was for me when I first played basketball. Before I played basketball in early elementary school PE class, I had never played, not even a pickup game. I had tried dribbling a basketball a few times, but not often and not very successfully. This was before I had a basketball goal in my backyard. It was before I began my five-year run with the Lions of the Covington, Virginia Youth Basketball League. So the first few times I got the ball in a pickup game at school, other kids immediately began shouting, double dribble. Apparently grabbing the ball with both hands between dribbles is frowned upon. But in spite of being bad at it, I began to really like basketball. So I went to tryouts at the Armory Gym and I was drafted in the last round, I'm sure, by the Lions. And I was the guy who went in at the end of the game when the team was either way ahead or hopelessly behind. The first time I got the ball in a game, it was at the beginning of the second half. And not realizing the team's switch basketball goals at halftime, I dribbled the wrong way. My coach was exasperated, but I said, hey, at least I didn't double dribble. That's progress. And in my early years of playing basketball, I was easy to coach. Why? I knew I wasn't good. I would have even taken advice from other players because I knew they were better than me. I absorbed what the coaches said because they knew so much more than me and I was humble about my game. But years later as a young adult, I played for a team that had a coach whose ability I did not respect. By that point, I'd gained some basketball knowledge and I was a better player and I was sure I knew more than the coach did. Kind of like every dad whose kid has ever played for another coach, right? All the coaches at home are nodding, yes, exactly. When we begin to think highly of ourselves in some area, we become resistant to instruction. We begin to look down on others. We might even start looking for people whom we consider inferior just so we can elevate ourselves at their expense. Proud parents criticize other parents. Proud employees ridicule other employees. Proud students feel superior to other students. Proud athletes look down on lesser athletes. And to be fair, it sometimes happens in the preacher and pastor world too. Pride leads us to devalue others. And spiritual pride causes us to devalue the faith and the faithfulness of other people. Spiritual perfectionism tempts us to applaud ourselves at the expense of other people. Jesus talked about this in one of his most important teachings. He told a memorable story that offers an important warning against perfectionist thoughts and tendencies. Luke 18, 9 reads, Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. It's always helpful when the gospel writers tell us what Jesus was thinking. There are times we can deduce his thoughts based on his actions and words, but sometimes the writers, Luke in this passage, make it obvious. In Luke 18, Jesus is addressing people who were very impressed with themselves, spiritually and morally. These are people who had a lot of perfect attendance pins at the temple. Lots of Camper of the Week awards at Lake Jerusalem Hebrew Assembly. But they're about to discover Jesus is not impressed with their spiritual credentials. And the way Jesus makes his point is the way he often made his point by telling a compelling story, a parable. Jesus begins in verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. Almost sounds like the setup to one of our jokes, doesn't it? A priest, a rabbi, and a pastor walk into a bar, right? A Pharisee and a tax collector walk into the temple. Now in the minds of those Jesus was addressing, this story immediately had a hero and a villain. They didn't need to hear another line. Why? Because the Pharisees were the most prominent religious group in Israel. They were the foremost practitioners of the Jewish faith. They were the professional believers 
the ones who learned all the nuances of God's law and the ones who claimed to painstakingly keep it. They wore little scripture boxes on their foreheads. They wore recognizable clothing. They stood on the street corners and prayed impressive prayers. On the other hand, tax collectors were spiritual nobodies and socially scorned. They were traitors in the eyes of their own people and everyone listening to Jesus knew it. They were informants and enforcers for the Roman government. Rome conquered first century Palestine for a simple reason, tax revenue. It was all about the Benjamins or the Caesars or whatever they nicknamed their large denominations of money. And tax collectors were the much despised conduit through which Rome siphoned money from their mostly poor subjects. And the Pharisee in Jesus' story obviously recognized all these dynamics. He was prepared to exploit the tax collector's lack of social approval to enhance his own. And you can tell from what he says. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Notice the way this man practiced his faith had made him very self-confident and very willing to judge others. Here is a man whose religious piety is clear to himself. His opening comment in his prayer is an expression of thanks to God for the fact that he is not the kind of spiritual and moral low life most people are. And did you notice where he is? The text says he is in the temple by himself. Have you heard the phrase, he or she stands alone? Perhaps when it comes to a talent or a service or a commitment, Sometimes marketers will suggest that a company stands alone when it comes to service or insight or performance. It's interesting that the Pharisee went to a public place of worship, and yet he physically separated himself from other people while he was there. But he isn't seeking solitude. He's seeking exclusivity. Big sinners worship over there. People like me, worship over here. There were cliques and classes inside the temple, and this guy supported it. Like that curtain between first class and coach on an airplane. Don't you hate it when they snap that curtain shut? And if you dare to walk through it, the first class passengers look at you like, how dare you? The flight attendant rushes you back to the cheap seats. And have you ever sat in the front row of coach with your tiny bag of stale peanuts and watched the first class passenger snacking on warm cashews? If so, you can comfort yourself with the knowledge that they paid $400 more for better peanuts. And maybe we should all rewatch last week's message on envy. The Pharisee stood alone. He went to the first class cabin at the temple. And we can only assume he thought that's how it should be. After all, the Old Testament law required fasting once a year. This guy fasted twice a week. Doesn't that put him on the religious all-star team? And notice he's a tither. Tithing is not easy. If you tithe, you know there's a temptation to let people know about it. Someone posts pictures from their awesome vacation back when we could still actually travel and take vacations. And you're tempted to say, well, I could take vacations like that if I didn't tithe. Or you drop a comment to your lunch group. Yeah, we got a tax refund check this week. It was pretty big. I guess there's an upside to tithing. Well, this Pharisee was so righteous, he probably wouldn't even claim the tax deduction. The Pharisees were striving for spiritual and moral perfection. They were the perfectionists of first century Judaism, but aspiring to perfection and wanting others to believe they had attained it twisted their hearts in ugly ways. They considered themselves better than everyone outside their circle, more devoted, 
closer to God. In Jesus' story, the Pharisee noticed and referenced the tax collector, and he did it with disdain. He was looking for someone to consider inferior, and the tax collector was an easy target in the eyes of other people. And yet, despite all the rules that had been followed by this Pharisee, Jesus was more impressed with another worshiper that day. So meet the tax collector. He also seems to isolate himself, but it wasn't because he thought he deserved an exclusive first-class spot at the temple. It was because he wasn't convinced he deserved to be there at all. In Luke 18, 13, Jesus continues, but the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Have you seen YouTube videos or TikToks of dog owners talking to their dogs after the animals have knowingly violated their training? Maybe a dog tears the stuffing out of a pillow, or maybe a dog gets into some forbidden food, but the canine knows it and won't look the human owner in the eye. The same dog who will stare into his owner's eyes for minutes on end at other times will not look at the owner. My son has dogs that were rescued, so they've been a little tough to train. And they used to think that when the humans were out of the house, the entire house was a bathroom. So Evan would come home, see the evidence, and call the dog's name with an ominous tone to his voice. And a dog that is normally all over him when he comes in the door will not come to him or look at him, won't lift his eyes to meet Evan's eyes. You see, dogs have a conscience. Cats are like, yeah, what about it? Clean it up and serve me dinner, and maybe I'll let you live. This man doesn't feel worthy to look up at God. That's sad in a sense, but it's also touching. He's that humble, he's that convicted. The next sentence reads, instead, he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I am a sinner. If you've ever wondered how to start a relationship with God, here's a good starting point. Because anyone who has enough self-awareness and enough humility to begin with God by saying, I am a sinner in need of mercy, is going to find it. The Bible promises that we will find it. Now, even though this entire story points to it, Jesus' post-parable commentary on this story blows people away. It was so outside their paradigm, it seemed outrageous, but Jesus said it. He said in verse 14, I tell you this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The one who had dedicated his life to striving for perfection went home further from God. The one who came to God without pretension, who owned his imperfection, went home closer to God, made right with God as we sometimes say it. Let me offer two takeaways from this very important parable. First, living for God is about trusting over trying. Another way to say it is that we can receive what we can never achieve. Perfectionism is all about trying, not trusting. It's exhausting, it's futile, it's destructive to relationships, and it will eventually destroy our self-esteem because we can't live up to its expectations. But friend, what we cannot accomplish through sheer effort, we can access by faith. Look at Romans 9 verse 30. It reveals a sad irony that many Jewish people missed God's promise because they would not make the shift from trying to trusting. It says, even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, 
who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in Him. This has always been a challenging thing for people to embrace because we assume religion is something we are supposed to do when it is first of all something we believe and someone we trust. And sometimes the people who have the toughest time accepting this are really good people, moral people, conscientious people, hardworking people, because people like that want to earn what they get not receive a gift. People like that want to obey God, not depend on His grace. But if we can't give up the notion that we can earn God's acceptance and forgiveness, we will never step into the beauty of Christianity. Ephesians 2 verse 9 says, salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. So let's put our focus on trusting God. Yes, that will lead us to obedience. It will cause us to do things that honor God. But we are invited to be first and foremost believers. We believe that God exists. We believe in God because He exists. And we believe that trusting in what God has done for us through Jesus is far better than trusting in what we can do for God. The second takeaway today is this. The more we acknowledge our weakness, the stronger we get. Now that goes against every instinct of a perfectionist, doesn't it? It sounds so backward, so upside down. But the scriptures coach us to acknowledge our weakness because doing so brings us closer to Jesus. Weakness is the conduit for God's strength. Hebrews 4.15 reads, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What does that mean? It means that if you pretend to be something you're not, or you pretend to be stronger than you are, you have to approach God on your own merit. You have to face temptation on your own power. You have to develop your character with your own strategy. You must strive to be a better spouse, a better parent, a better person on your own. But if you approach God, not on the basis of your strength, but humbly confessing your weakness, it gives you access to divine resources. You receive understanding. You get mercy. You encounter God's grace. Friend, there are some things that are easier to do at the church building than they are at home. We allow ourselves to do them at church because they seem like they belong at church. But if you'll push back a moment on what seems normal or comfortable for you at home or at work, Wherever you're watching from today, I'd like you to do something. In the passage we just explored, we saw the prayer of the tax collector. So I'd like us to pray the same thing in a moment. But I'd like us to emulate his posture before God. If you can bring yourself to do it, will you stand? Stand up in front of the couch or beside the chair or beside the bed. Wherever you're watching this, stand because in the passage we read, the tax collector was standing. And if you're willing to do it, I'd like you to take your hand and lightly tap it against your sternum. That scripture says he beat his chest. I don't want you to bruise yourself or cause yourself pain, but I want you to thump your chest like you would. If something suddenly convicted you, like you would if you realized you had done a great wrong, will you do that? And now will you say with me and after me, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. 
then if you will, repeat this prayer too. Dear Father, help me put my spiritual determination into trusting you. Not trying to be perfect or appear perfect. Help me receive what I cannot achieve. Help me remember that in my weakness, you are strong. Help me discover what it means to depend on you and not on myself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.